All right. Welcome to week one of CSD 215, Introduction to Database. Um, I'm sure you've already, you may have already experienced this at least at one other class. So I'm going to introduce what the course is going to be teaching you, how things are going to get evaluated and whatnot. And then I will dive into the actual lecture material for this week. So basically, I'm just what I just said. Um, I'm not big on reading the slides. All the slides are posted. Uh, sometimes you'll notice that I'll use slides, my slide deck slightly different than what is posted uh, because I noticed some last minute discrepancies. Um, but normally it's because I just remembered something I want to talk about and I'll throw it into the slides because I use the slides as my lecture notes. Um, but yeah, I'll talk about uh, each part of the course, uh, how things are going to get graded, um, the assessment for each component, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm your theory prof and I have one lecture section. Uh, there's two other lecture sections. Uh, my name is Daniel Goudreau, but I usually go by Dan. Uh, you'll notice there's no extra letters after my name. Uh, I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, contact details are there. Um, I rarely do office appointments except by Zoom, uh, which I will explain why also in a moment. Uh, so far I have received a pile of Cal letters. If you're still in process at Cal, don't panic. They'll get them to me eventually. All right, so a little bit about me. I graduated from Canador College in 1996. I'm a college graduate, you're not a university guy. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since. Since 1996, I have been unemployed a grand total of four weeks. So, you know, I've been around the ball court a few times. Um, I work full time and I teach part time. Um, I've been teaching for at least 16 years. Uh, actually, I need to update the slide because it's closer to 17 now. I currently work for a company called Cadillac Technology. Um, it's a division of another company called Fiery Canada, uh, a company I work for got bought out last year. So we're between names at the moment. Um, I'm a full stack web developer uh, and also an AWS administrator. So basically put, if it has something to do with, you know, internet, I've probably touched it. Um, literally everything from designing databases all the way to implementing front end code for, you know, UI to state standing up all the infrastructure to actually serve it up to our clients. So I've done it all. Uh, but what I have never done is written a single line of Java or a single line of C. So I will never be able to help you with your Java work or your any other classes. Um, so what kind of person am I? Uh, I tend to have a pretty loose and easygoing teaching style. Um, like I said, I don't have teaching notes. I've been teaching this course for a long time. Um, I know the material. Uh, I've been told I tend to be sarcastic. Um, that's life. Uh, I also tend to understand that life happens. Um, I mean, it was happening before COVID, it's happening during COVID and it happened after COVID. Life is happening. Uh, people get sick, uh, dogs eat laptops, cars get wrecked, life happens. Um, however, I only have so much patience for um, life happening. I've had cases where people kept saying, yeah, my dog, you know, ate my laptop. My dog peed on my laptop. On the third laptop, I was getting tired of it. Although legitimately, a dog did pee three times on their laptop because he literally had a new laptop every time. <laughs> but, you know, um, I've also been told I'm an equal opportunity offender. Um, by that, I mean, um, I'll call people out in class when they're being stupid. So if you're being disruptive or irritating, I will call you out. And I'm probably not going to be very nice about it either. Uh, even though I'm fairly easygoing and, you know, fairly patient, there's only so much of that I'll put up with. Um, yeah, so that's me. All right, so usually here we have a slide full of names. Um, in lieu of that, there's a section in Brightspace under... Uh, contact information. It'll show, you know, who the lab profs are, what rooms they're in, what time they're at. Realistically, you also have this information in Access. I just leave it on Brightspace to make life easy for you guys. 
Okay, uh, email protocol. Um, this is a boilerplate e uh, slide. Uh, it says, I'll do my best to respond to your email inquiries within 48 hours. Um, weekends could take longer. Um, realistically, I usually answer pretty quick, unless literally, you know, I'm, I'm up to my neck and stuff at my day job. And send it to me via uh, Algonquin email address only. Um, because what happens occasionally is you'll have people send it from their personal email address and our mail server will block it for whatever reason or randomly will decide your email that looks a little too fishy and it drops it. So when it's sent through your Algonquin live email, it bypasses all the spam blockers because it goes literally from one mail server to another mail server within your organization. So that's why we say, please send your email using your Algonquin college email address. It's just to make sure we get the messages. Okay, lab structure. This semester, uh, they've decided to change how labs are done in this course. And I think all the courses are pretty much gonna be like this. Uh, labs are split into two pieces. Uh, there's a part A and a part B. Um, part A is supposed to be done during the lab period and submitted by the end of the lab period. Part B, you have the rest until the due date to get it done. Currently, I am kind of ignoring the fact that you're supposed to get lab one part A done in the lab, at least in with my group, because there's people that didn't even have computers yet. <laughs> so if you don't have a PC, it's hard to get the lab one part A done in class if you don't have a machine to do it on. Holy cap, crap, it's hot in here. Um, so, If we don't, if you don't submit by the due date, we are just not going to grade it. That's the policy we've been given. Uh, we're supposed to write you guys a little harder on your due dates this semester. Um, and I completely understand why there is seven sections of database. So we all have to follow the same rules and they, you know, they had a big meeting and they made the rules up. Um, so that means that if at 80 students a section times seven, you know, that's a lot of just students that we have to do. So we have seven lecturers, seven, 21 lab sections, and they all have to follow the same rules. Um, assignments. Okay, assignments are gonna be 30, worth 30% 30 of your final grade. Uh, there's two assignments. Assignment one is gonna be due week seven. Assignment two is gonna be due week 14. Uh, both assignments must be submitted in Brightspace and demoed in the lab session. Uh, that's the, that's something that we've enforced for a while now, is that the assignments must be demoed. Um, your lab prof will decide how you're gonna, what they're gonna do to you during your demo. Um, it's just to make sure you actually did the work yourself. There has been cases where people just got someone else to do the work for them. And then once we started doing demos and they, don't even write, they, you, they, you show them the document, their faces go blank as they've never seen it. It's a bad sign. Okay. Um, obviously lectures are going to be done here. Uh, attendance is important. Um, that having been said, by now most of you have probably noticed I'm wearing a microphone and I have a camera. Uh, I'm one of the freaks that records his lectures like probably the only prof that records his lectures. Um, they haven't told me to stop yet, so I'm gonna keep doing it until they tell me to stop. Um, so I'm a big fan of your coughing, sneezing, snotting, licking doorknobs, don't come to class. I don't want you getting everybody else sick. I'm not a fan of sick people in class. You're, it's One, it's gross. Two, you're going to make other people sick. Three, you're distracting. So for you guys, this is probably your last class of the day, right? If you're sick, I don't take attendance in lecture. I have to take attendance in lab, but I don't take attendance in lecture. So the recording is usually posted same day, next day. 
So usually within 24 hours, unless something's gone horribly wrong. There has been times where, you know, there have been some um, technological failures, including um, forgetting to turn on my microphone, amongst the other stupid things. Um, but, or having Camtasia crash, I've had that happen too. Um, so attendance is important, but as, you know, we all got the email today from risk mitigation about, you know, people that are sick, don't come to school. I am not going to force you guys to be here if you're sick. Is that fair? Good. Because I don't like being sick. The midterm exam will be done here during week seven. Uh, the final exam will be in a designated location that will be announced later. Uh, it happens. The final exam is an interesting experience for all of you guys. Um, because you will be writing at the same time as the other six sections. Your 500 and change of you are going to be writing the same exam at the same time. Um, I can guarantee that a bunch of you are going to be in the gym. That's the one by the Tim Hortons. And usually what they do is they, they cordon off part of the cafeteria and you're going to, the other group will probably be sitting in the cafeteria. And this group is so big that there may actually be another, another group somewhere else. Um, it's going to be interesting, to say the least. Uh, I'm glad I don't make the logistics for that one. Okay. So there's classroom lectures. Um, as a term goes on, I tend to do, especially the second half, I tend to, it tends to be very hands-on for me. Um, I will demonstrate what I'm lecturing. And there's been cases where I have the slide deck ready. And I just start discussing what I'm supposed to be discussing. I discover I covered half the slide deck while I was doing demonstrations. Um, you're going to get labs and assignment exercises. Um, you're going to have reading tasks. <clears throat> um, you guys are engineering technology, right? CT? Okay. This is where I'm going to say where I'm going to post. Um, pages for reading based on both the 15th and the 16th editions of the book. Because if you know where to go look, you can get the 15th edition for free. Yar. Um, 16th edition, on the other hand, is quite difficult to get electronically. You don't have a second database course unless you choose to take it later. It's an elective for you guys. So not sure the $200 textbook is worth the money. Um, because right now I think it still comes in as a physical textbook. Um, because it's a recommended textbook, not a required textbook for level one. They don't include it in your tuition. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, there's going to be some review. Um, and there's also hybrids. So there's four hybrids. Uh, these are tasks you do on your own time. Uh, the slide decks for them, there's basically you're going to read some slide decks and at some point a quiz will be unlocked. You're going to do the quiz. Your grade is your grade. Obviously, you're going to do whatever you are, however you are, with as many people as you want. Not like I can watch you guys when you're sitting at home. You know, you finish your LOL match, go do your hybrid, go trash talk some more people on LOL. I know how it works. And the textbook in question is this one, 16th edition of database processing. Um, I will be giving you guys stuff to read out of about seven chapters of the book. So that's about a half the book. It's up to you if you read it. I, it's just good to round out your uh, understanding. Um, but yeah, that's the one. Uh, I'll be giving you guys, you know, extra links or extra material as needed, if applicable. All right, so you guys will have 10 labs worth 25% of your grade, which means each lab is worth 2.5% of your grade. It's important to do your labs. Um, I know it's, it sounds like I'm being facetious. Um, 
but I've actually had students where the difference between an A and an A plus was the fact that they decided to not do a lab. I've also had a case where a student was the difference between an F and a D was also not doing the exact same lab. So do your labs because that 2.5% can make a huge difference. Uh, two assignments worth 30%. Four hybrid quizzes worth 10%. So each quiz is worth 2.5%. Uh, your midterm exam is worth 15%. And then the final exam is 20%. So far, the structure has been that the midterm, so you got weeks one to week six, midterm exam. Midterm exam covers one to six. And hopefully they decide to keep this again this way because then the final exam is only from weeks nine to week 14. So you don't, for the final exam, so far you didn't need to study whatever happened before the break. It's like two little courses in one, which is kind of good. So, however, you got to pass both. Um, so that, that means that you have to pass your hybrids, your midterm and your final exam. Combined grade between the three has to be 50%. And then you have to also pass your practical and your assignment, I mean, your labs and your assignments for 50%. I've also had the case where somebody did fantastic on the tests and did crappy on the labs and not pass. So at least try to get 50% on both sides so I don't have to give you an F. Um, not that it really bothers me, but it still feels shitty when you know a student actually tried, but then they just didn't bother do something and then I end up having to give them the F. Um, it is what it is. Okay, so we're gonna introduce you to, hang on, I should know better. It is the world's loudest classroom. And they're gonna be loud on that side, but at least should take care of this. So we're gonna introduce you to concept databases, what databases do. Uh, we're gonna talk, we're gonna learn about, well, you guys are gonna learn about database modeling. So essentially, by the time you're done this course, you are not going to be an expert, database designer, modeler. You will understand the concepts of it. Um, when I went through college, mine was a three-year program, but it was focused on business systems and database. I had four database courses, two of which were design. So you guys are getting four weeks of four weeks of design. So you know. That it's going to be pretty shallow, but you're going to have you're going to know enough to be able to start learning more on your own if it interests you. Um, you're going to learn the basic concepts of SQL. You will actually get a fairly solid grounding in standard SQL. We're not going to get into super detail with some of the really uh, wild and weird stuff that SQL can do. But you will learn how to query a database, how to create records and you know manipulate the data in the database. So all right, we already talked about this. So the hybrids cover important material as required uh, that are considered essential for this course. I, the, I know for a fact there's one hybrid that's currently being reworked. It's the last one. Uh, we decided that the content wasn't quite right, uh, but we just, you know, whoever's in charge of the course just handed it off to someone else. So, you know, that we're rapidly trying to make things work. Um, don't ignore the hybrid tasks. They're up to 10% of your course mark. Again, it's the difference between an A and an A+. Plus. I've had a person that was sitting at 88%, but then do a single hybrid. If they'd done one hybrid, they would have had the A plus. So just do them. They're not terrible. Like, honestly, I think it takes 10 minutes to read the slides and the quiz is like five minutes. It's a great way to get your 10%. Yes. I'll be showing you guys that in a minute. Okay. Um, Peer tutoring. The Student Learning Center has a variety of options. If you're struggling, um, 
you can reach out to the Student Learning Centre and they can get you in touch. All Everybody gets a certain number of hours of free tutoring included with their tuition. Um, often it's former students that took this course before you that had a good grade that end up tutoring. So they usually know the material fairly well. Um, maybe restricted due to COVID, but I mean, we're just putting that as a general disclaimer nowadays. Uh, considering we could also throw in flu and RSV in there. There's a variety of things that could shut that place down. Um, there's also student counseling services. Uh, you know, if you're having a rough time, there's somebody to help. All right. Send an email. If you're not available for the lab or lecture, realistically, I care more if you email me about the labs than the lecture. Uh, because I have to take your attendance in lab. So it's kind of important. If you fall sick, send me an email. I don't need a letter if you're your doctor. Uh, we used to require a doctor's note. We no longer require a doctor's note. But then again, remember that slide where I don't really, you know, there's only so much I'll take. If you're literally sick every week for an entire semester, you might want to rethink your college career, at least until you stop being sick. Um, Yeah, I don't need a doctor's note. I've had cases where students sent me selfies from the ER. Like, really, I don't need to know that. Don't need to see that. Um, just saying. All right. Uh, Cal students, Center for Accessible Learning. Again, if you have a letter and you haven't gotten one yet, uh, if you have not gotten one, but you're just going through the process, they'll send it to me. If... You are supposed to have one and you haven't, and I, you have not heard from them in like two weeks. You want to follow up with them. Uh, Cal has some amazing resources for all kinds of um, learning challenges. Let's go with that phrase. Uh, my daughter went through Cal and she milked it for all it's worth. All it's worth. Like she gets noise canceling earphones when she takes tests. She gets extra time. She's allowed to record lectures. They, I know, but not all the profs do. Um, she was given one of those fancy notebooks and pens that actually records her handwriting, that she hooks it up and actually transfers her notes to her computer, and they just gave it to her. So if you are registered with Cal, talk to your Cal counselor. They have all kinds of things they, they can do to help you. Um, all this tech counts as actually as income, so it goes on your taxes, but realistically, most of you probably aren't generating a lot of income. Hello? Okay. Uh, I, this is just more uh, repetition, how to be successful in the course. Of course, as always, try to attend class as much as you can, especially the labs. Uh, do all the assessments. You know what? It's better to have a shitty grade in an assessment than not give me an assessment at all. Because even if you fail the assessment, it still counts towards your total of the 50%. Therefore, just do the assessments. Like, do the labs. Just do them. Um, better if you do them right, but at least do them. Um, plan your time effectively. So, for you, for a lot of you, college is the first kick at the can where you're treated like an adult. I am not going to hunt you down if you don't do your homework. It's You're on your own. I have other things to do than hunt you down. I have video games to play, anime to watch, fish to catch. I work 55, 60 hours a week. I'm not going to spend extra hours a week hunting people down that didn't do their homework because all it's going to do for me is less grading. So don't do your work. You're giving me less work to do. I still get paid. It's all good. But plan your time. Don't waste your time. Um, that's when I say, you know, you're not high. Some of you are older students, mature students. Probably time management's probably a little more, you know, settled. Some of you are fresh out of high school where they practically held you by the hand all the way through. Uh, there's no hand holding in this class at all. Um, Go to Brightspace. Um, I'm also one of the few profs that pa posts a weekly announcement that tells you what you're supposed to do, what you should be working on, when things are due. 
nicely summarized. So you don't need to sit there and try to hunt through the course shell to find where you know things are. There's lead links and everything. Um, if you have a chance, try to reach ahead um, and keep an eye on your due dates. Like I said earlier, when things are past the due date, it's an automatic zero. You just, you know, save me some grading. Okay. So there's a couple of documents. You'll find them in uh, Brightspace, and I'll be showing you guys where this stuff is in a minute. Uh, make sure you review the dishonesty and plagiarism documents. Um, I think you guys know what plagiarism is. You know, it's taking somebody's work and saying it's yours. That's a big no-no. Um, that includes posting questions to Stack Overflow and waiting for someone to answer you. I heard somebody chuckle. I actually busted a student for that and he got expelled because he got all three strikes at the same time. He needed, he provided exam questions and he, because it was answered, provided an answer to an exam question. I just walked him from the room to the chair and then he was just escorted off the premises. So, you know, Chegel or Chegg, whatever the heck it is, Stack Overflow, great tools to learn, but do the work yourself. Uh, there's also the CSI in there. It shows you what's happening every week, theoretically. Um, like I said, I'll, before I t dive into today's lecture, I will be um, showing you guys a quick tour of where things are in Brightspace, at least for this course. Okay. Um, yeah, attend your lab section. There's about that. And make sure lab one already is started or you should be able to get lab one started. It's posted. Uh, so far, I've had one Mac user. And surprise, I don't have instructions for Mac. However, you can actually get all the same software for Mac and you don't need to install like VMware or, or uh, Parallels or any of that, especially if you've got one of the newer Macs. The M1, the, the Apple Silicon Macs, the M1, M2 Macs. You will, you'll never get the Windows software that we use for this course to run on that. Um, and considering you're in CET, you're going to have a hard time later anyways, because there's courses that require stuff for Windows. So just careful with your Macs. Okay, now I'm going to pop into Course Shell. Course Shell. And it's going to be slow. There we go. Okay. When you open up the course shell, I'm sure you guys have been at least to one other course shell by now. And those of you that had me yesterday have seen some of this already. Um, announcements. This is where you're going to, every week, you're going to see an announcement that says what you should be working on, what you should be reading, what your due dates are, what things you should be focusing on. Under content, um, actually, let me switch over to student view so that you guys don't get all the noise. Okay, under content. So under course information, it shows the breakdown of the grades. These are the plagiarism and honesty documents and the CSI is here. Um, the CSI covers when things are happening, when things are due, um, and literally what's happening week one, week two, week three. So. The CSI, the course section information. Uh, I think they, they just changed the name now. They call it uh, the course schedule. Everything is in here, what you guys should be learning. So that's under uh, course information. Under contact info, here's our uh, prof list and for this lecture section. Um, and I'm aware that uh, your normal, the guys that have the group that has lab on Monday, is currently got a different lab prof for I think one week, maybe two weeks, because Wander's out of town. Uh, but he'll be back. Uh, Wander's actually covered my lab several times before, so he actually knows the material, so shouldn't be too bad. Under recordings, you guess I'll give you three guesses what you're going to find under recordings. The camera. Um, under weekly lecture material, you'll see all the slide decks and all that fun stuff. Uh, labs, as the labs become available, they will show up under labs. Right now, only lab one is visible to you. 
Um, there has been a uh, slight wrinkle with one of the instructions. My lab instructions have been updated. I warned all the other profs. Um, for the second part, it's, it used to say grab the latest version. It's updated to say grab the latest version 15 because version 16 is missing a piece. Uh, version 16 is actually uh, in beta. So they didn't include the administration tools with it. So it's kind of hard to do that part of the course if you don't have the tools. Uh, under assignments, this is where you're going to find your assignments. Under hybrids is where you are going to find your slides um, and all your documents for that. And all the quizzes you'll be able to find under activities. So assignments, quizzes. Um, assignments is where you can submit your labs if you want. Quizzes is where the hybrids are going to be. Right now, none of them are visible because they have not been released to you. Once the hybrid quizzes and the lab quizzes become available to you for labs two, three, and four, and five, you'll see them showing up in here. And that's the uh, short tour of Brightspace. Okay. Any questions about what I talked about so far? Going once, going twice, going three times. Okay, this is gonna be the quiet group, isn't it? I always have a quiet group every semester. Looks like it's gonna be you guys. Better in my group last semester, they were super disruptive. Okay, so we're gonna dive into this week's uh, material. Okay. So, I'm gonna put the disclaimer here. I did not create these slide decks. I've been massaging them. Uh, they're a little disjointed. They're basically pulled right from the, right from the textbook materials. Uh, except, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced the slide decks that come from textbooks before. They basically put the entire textbook as slides. So like chapter one is 126 slides. And how much of that is important? Like 10, 15 slides. So the person who put together the slides for this course, basically, you know, took those slides and just hashed them up. So they're a little disjointed. Um, but they're there to help me remember what I need to talk about. So internet and mobile device world. So once was a time we actually had to explain to students what, you know, how internet worked. That uh, comes as a shock. Uh, since considering how connected we all are to our worlds now via our laptops, our phones, whatever else we happen to use. And what often happens is you'll have users that use some sort of device. It either goes over the internet, it goes over a cell phone network, it'll go to some sort of server somewhere, and I guarantee that server somewhere is talking to a database. Your entire lives are stored in people's databases. There are different kinds of databases, you know, different products, but I can guarantee every part of your life is in a database somewhere. And a database is an organized collection of related data. So the thing is that there isn't a single database with everything in it, obviously. Can you imagine if the, your bank shared its database with the government? The government would always know how much money you have. And the college also shared that database. It's not one single database, right? Imagine if it was just one big giant database with everything in it, that'd be terrible. Uh, the you know, privacy issues would be incredible. So normally what we do is we create databases that serve a purpose. And normally in that database, there'll be a collection of data that is related to itself, to its purpose. So for example, a database at a bank will have banking information about you. It'll have your name, your address, that kind of stuff, plus what bank accounts you have, what transactions you've done, that kind of thing. The college has a database 
College has lots of databases. But a college has a database specifically called Access. I'm sure you guys have experienced Access by now, that nice archaic looking system. Uh, it's written in COBOL, for those of you that are curious. Access runs in COBOL and it exports the data to the web servers nightly. So whatever you see in Access is 24 hours old for the most part, uh, except for a few specific pieces. A database is referred to as a self-describing collection of tables. So a database that contains data also describes itself. It's a self-contained entity. Um, I mean, we can think of, you know, think about our, each of us as an individual database, right? We're self-describing. We contain related data. It's all in here, but you know, it contain you all contain related data. Each database is self-describing. Um, the tables are called integrated because they store relationships between different chunks of data. So for example, if I go back to thinking about the school, the database here at the school. For students, we have varying pieces of related data. We have student information, we have courses, we have programs. We also know what students are enrolled in what courses because those are relations. Uh, that's why it's called integrated because each of these pieces are probably connected to something else. It's all integrated as a single thing. Uh, the database is called self-describing because it literally stores a description of itself. A backup of the database is able to rebuild the entire database, structure and data. It's self-contained. Uh, the self-describing data is called metadata, which is basically data about data. Um, so inside the database, there's the data. So student information, name, address, date of birth. But there's also information in there that says, this is the structure of a student. So there's going to be information about each of you, but there's also information that tells the database server how that data is organized. That's the metadata. Um, and this is literally a repeat of what I just finished saying. So databases are everywhere. Um, the, the effect on our lives is really extensive. Um, they're responsible for many, and I'm gonna say for all services we use nowadays. And then we're gonna talk about some of the well-known examples um, that we see. Okay, uh, online video streaming. So Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, et cetera, et cetera. There's definitely databases in there. Um, it tracks what shows they have. It tracks your history of what you've watched. Um, and I actually happen to know a little bit about the structure behind Netflix because uh, their entire structure runs on uh, Amazon, which is really entertaining because Amazon Video also runs from Amazon. Um, they also store all the video in what's called an S3 bucket. Uh, the database basically says, hey, in this region, this video is available in this location. So when you start streaming, it's not gonna pull your Netflix stream from California, it's probably pulling it from Montreal because Netflix has a probably, probably have, I'm saying probably here, not 100% sure, but they have a mirror of their data in Montreal. That means if you're in Ottawa and you start watching Netflix, it's basically going Ottawa to whatever your provider goes to Montreal, not from you down to Toronto, down to California via something else. Um, their database tracks where all of these files are. It's kind of cool. Um, so there's a lot of data that's stored uh, outside of the fact where, you know, what have you watched? What's your username? Have you paid for extra devices? You know, what shows are available to you in your region? Uh, they also extract a lot of um, metrics. And it's usually stored in something like a database system called Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra is designed literally for doing analytics. So personal cloud storage. Um, so Whoever wrote these slides way back in the day so detached from reality. So if you save photos on your phone, like really? Every time you take a picture, it gets saved on your phone. 
but it will back up. Most of you will also get the experience that backs up your phone, right? So if you're Android, it's probably going to Google Cloud, or Google Photos. If you're on Apple, it's going to something in Apple land, uh, whatever the heck that is. Um, or, you know, if you're like me, it, my, my photos don't get backed up to Google. They get backed up to Amazon, Amazon Photos. Um, there's, of course, a database is there that store all the information about your pictures, all your files, that kind of stuff, because it just gets uploaded. Um, same thing, like here at the school, you guys all get uh, a terabyte of OneDrive space, just so you know. Use it, by the way. It's included with your tuition. Use that terabyte of backup space because you can drop all your documents and they get backed up automatically. So then if your dog pees on your laptop, your files are all your important files are backed up. Um, so it's included with your Office account. Um, Microsoft, for example, OneDrive, the files get copied up. They get put into a database in Microsoft, at Microsoft and some some database of some sort. So you know when you go to OneDrive online and you're browsing through all your files, you're not actually browsing through your files. You're browsing through database entries that generates links to where your files actually are. All right, sports. I don't really need to go into detail, but anybody here who follows any kind of sports also realizes just how much data is involved in sports, especially baseball. Baseball seems to be excessive. Um, I mean, uh, there's other other sports. Hockey's really bad that way too for tracking stats, and basketball is pretty good that way too. Um, all the stats, all the brosters, everything is there. It's all stored in databases. I mean, you can go online and just browse through all the leagues and find out what there is. And I'll throw in esports uh, in here too. I'm sure there's at least two people in here that watch esports of some sort and or participate and think they're good enough to participate. Um, hey, I mean, I can't laugh. I, I made that comment once and I found out I had a, a person that was ranked third in the world in my class. So, you know, it is what it is. Esports has tons of stats too, you know, number of kills, average time to death, stuff like that. Uh, finances. I think that one really doesn't need to go without a lot of saying. The financial world is basically what caused databases to exist. They are the number one um, set of organizations that pushes database concepts forward after porn. No, I'm not kidding. I mean, I don't need to go into detail there either, but, um, but banks were the original source of database. They had database systems on paper that made sense, where they could still track and actually retrieve information really quickly and was still just done on paper. They've been, they're the kings of organizing information. And considering the sheer volume of financial transactions that happens every day, databases are stupid powerful. I mean, I'm of an age where I remember when bank cards showed up. Okay, I'm old enough to remember when I got my first bank card for the first time. And then I remember the first time I could go to an ATM. But even that had some weird limitations where you can only use the ATM to an 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., stuff like that. Um, and look where we are now where I can just tap my phone to get my cup of coffee. Who's pushing all this technology? Banks. Um, they are. They have so much data that they're actually able to predict all kinds of things ahead of time because they're able to watch trends over years and years and years of internal private data. Like they can see like, you know, what the average bank balances are over the last 40 years. They've got that kind of data. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> Government organizations.
governments love their databases. Um, what is the one of the most important databases in Canada? Or which organization has one of the most important databases? Which one? Uh, no, I was going to go with the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, they are definitely the ones that know the most about everybody in Canada. Um, why? Because they have your tax information. They know how much you made. You know, they know where you work. They know what medical claims you've done. You know how much rent you pay. You know how much property tax you pay. They know a lot about you. They don't use it for anything nefarious. They just know a lot about you. Um, after that will be probably uh, Immigration Canada will be one of the next big ones. Um, Health Canada has a couple really big databases too, where they take summarized data from all the provinces to, you know, generate trends and whatnot. Um, yeah, the government without a database would screech to a halt. I, again, I'm of an age where I remember where if you needed to do anything with the government, you had to walk to a government office, wait in line, fill out some paperwork, wait four months for them to get back to you. Nowadays, you know, you need to do your passport, especially if you're doing a, a, a renewal, you can actually renew your passport online now in Canada. Like, Click, 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 click. It's like five minutes. It's all because it's all in a database and it's pushed by a database. Uh, social media. Yeah, I really don't need to explain social media to you guys. I'm pretty sure you're well aware that Facebook knows everything about you. Whether you use Facebook or not, it still knows everything about you. Because you're probably uh, using Instagram or one of the other press services too, and they know everything about you. Um, they've gotten in trouble because of that. <laughs> so, you know, but they know everything about you. Um, tons of databases. In this case, one of the funny thing is, is uh, Facebook is one of the big, uh, one of the big con contributors to MySQL, or they were, uh, but for a long time, MySQL, which is, you know, what you guys are gonna be learning database design on, was being developed aggressively by uh, Facebook, they were contributing source code back. They were improving, fixing bugs, giving it back. Um, they tend to use a lot of uh, reliable and capable databases. Um, that's actually a lot of what Facebook was doing, was trying to make MySQL more reliable. Space, MySQL is a little special. E-commerce. Can anybody in here say they've never bought anything online ever in their lives? Not a single time. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, okay, how many of you have never bought anything from Amazon? Or AliExpress? Okay, so one, two, three. Um, yeah. We all buy stuff online. Maybe you bought it from Best Buy. Maybe you bought something from, from I don't know, uh, GameStop, even Loblaws. Take your pick. It's all online. Amazon obviously has extensive database stuff about you, your shopping trends. Uh, it suggests really interesting things to me every once in a while. Um, but usually a lot of things you'll see in there is purchase history. Uh, based on our purchase history, they can do recommendations. And it's all stored in their databases. And then you've got healthcare. Healthcare is actually one of the few items that is lagging a little bit. The hospitals themselves are pretty good. But there isn't a I don't know if there's a single province in Canada yet that has a proper integrated healthcare network where, you know, you can go see your GP and they put in notes and then you walk into the ER and your notes are already there. We don't have that in Ontario yet. They've tried, they spent billions, lined their friends' pockets and nothing ever came of it. Um, it is what it is. But on the other hand, hospitals and doctor's offices uh, have... You've probably experienced it by now. Doctors offices and hospitals have gotten very good with their electronic documents. My family doctor doesn't have 
paper documents at all, except for prescriptions. And even that's almost never anymore. Uh, if you go with Pharma, Pharma Plus, Rexall, Shoppers, Costco, they don't even print you a thing. They just click the button and go, do you want to send to your pharmacy? They go, yes. And then they receive a prescription automatically. So healthcare is getting better. Um, but it's not quite there yet. But there's a lot of complex databases in there. Weather. Uh, weather predictions. Yeah, we know how good those are. However, a lots of the stats are stored in databases. Like when they're doing weather forecasts, it's all stored in a database and they render the data from the database. Um, there's all kinds of cool stuff with that. All right, I'm just gonna do a lap around the block for a second so I can close that door. I have to remember next week to close those doors. I just didn't feel like hopping over my wire. Okay, characteristics of relational databases. So, so far you may have gotten a clue that the purpose of a database is to track information of interest to them. In other words, a bank tracks information about financials, the government tracks information about your taxes. Uh, Facebook tracks information about everything about you because they want to know everything about you. Um, that kind of thing. So databases can be sorted into two categories, relational and non-relational. In relational is what we're going to be focusing on in this course. A non-relational is tends to be used for high performance environments, um, but eventually it always trickles down to a relational system of some sort. Uh, large data sets are referred to as big data. It always makes me laugh when I hear the phrase big phrase big data because it's a buzzword. Essentially, it's data that has millions of rows. Usually billions of rows of data. It's just there's lots of data, so it's big data. So data is stored in something called tables. Tables have rows and columns. How many of you have used a spreadsheet? Excel, whatever the heck it is that's on a Mac, sheets, whatever. Um, so a spreadsheet's not a database table. Just going to put that now. But it's helpful to think in the same general kind of structure. Um, there's a database structure. There's a table structure that defines what fields are in it. Each of the columns would be basically everything going across sideways, just like the columns in a spreadsheet. And the rows would be the ones going down. A database may have multiple tables. Uh, I can honestly say that your database will have multiple tables. Um, you'd never see a single table database. There's no point. Um, each row in a data and a table stores data about an occurrence or an instance of a thing of interest. So we have a table about students. Each row in this table is a record about a single student. Your row, your row, your all rows. When we're talking about database design, those rows are also known as instances. So you are an instance of a student. You're an instance of a student. I hope you guys are instance of students. But each of you is an instance. So a single row is an instance. So you'll hear me use the phrase instance going in the future. That means I'm referring to a specific collection of information about a topic. In other words, the information about a single student. All the students have the same kind of information in the database, but the collection that has to do with one student is known as an instance. And the database stores data and relationships. In other words, it stores data about students, it stores data about profs, it stores the relationship between students and profs. How, you, how, do you, how does the connection from you to me happen? It's all described inside the database. So data is known as recorded facts and figures. And information can be defined as knowledge derived from data. And 
depending on where you're reading, sometimes you'll see the word information used before and after the word data. Um, so essentially you have disorganized information. It gets put into a database, so it's turned into the data. Then you take that data and you convert it into organized information. And information is stuff that's derived from the database, um, data presented in a meaningful context. Um, for example, when you guys log into Access and you look at your, your uh, timetable, that is data present, presented to you, hopefully in a meaningful context. I have this class in this room on this day, at this time, with that prof. That's actually a lot of data. Just put a little, you know, yellow, blue, green box, whatever color happens to be for you guys. Um, data process by summarizing, ordering, averaging, computing. A good example of that is you open up your bank account and you look at that there's zero money left in there. Because you just had to go buy those six packs of magic cards yesterday. But, for example, that's going to show you a summary. The total is a summation of the transactions in your account. Um, there could be other stuff like averaging or other simulations. So, look at your grades. You'll discover Brightspace averaging your grades, that kind of stuff. Um, Databases record data. They do it in such a way that we can produce information because uh, things are stored and organized. Um, for example, data on students' classes and their grades could produce information about a student's GPA. You know, they got an A plus in this course, they got a B in another course, they got a B, they got an A. You add up all those things, you do whatever math it is that generates a GPA and you end up with like, you know, 3.5. So a database system consists of four components, users, database applications, database management systems, and the actual database. So the users are the people interacting with the database system. So for example, you open up your bank account and you're gonna e-transfer, you know, 10 bucks to a buddy because he's picking you up, uh, you know, like a single fry at McDonald's, 10 bucks. That person interacting with the bank account is a user. The teller at the bank is also a user. The banking manager that approved your student loan is also a user. The database application, that is what the software you're interacting with. So your BMO app on your phone or your Royal Bank app or whatever app you happen to use, uh, the teller may have something else, like some piece of software that they use to interact. It's all talking to the same database, but the applications are different. There's a database management system. That's the actual software that runs the database. Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, on and on and on. There's like there's like hundreds. Um, and then there's the database. The database is the actual structure that contains the data. Um, all relational database servers or DBMSs are able to do pretty much the same thing more or less, they might do it slightly differently, but they all do it more or less the same. So databases, you can't take the database files out of one server and put it like, you can't grab the files from Oracle and put them into Microsoft SQL server. That'd be like saying, you're gonna take your Word document and try to edit it using Notepad. It's just not gonna work. But you could export the data from one and put it into the other, so. Um, then there's SQL, the structured query language. Um, it's basically a standard language used by all relational database systems. Uh, that's what you're gonna be learning for the second half of this term. Uh, DBMS, it's programmed to create, process, and administer a database. Uh, you guys don't take any database administration in this course, um, but you will be using a DBMS software in the first half to design databases and the second half to query the server. Um, the database application is one of the computer programs that serves as an intermediary between the user and the database. Another good example for you guys, Access. You can rent a locker through Access. You can, you know, find out how much you owe. If you have outstanding fees, et cetera, et cetera, all through Access. You interact with Access, Access talks to the database. 
somewhere. I've never, I don't know where. It's somewhere in C building. That I do know it's in C building somewhere. Um, it's really old. They're working on replacing it. But Access has been here since the college was founded. And it hasn't been replaced. Why? Because it works. It doesn't work well. It doesn't work fast. But it still gets the job done. Uh, they're apparently trialing a new system, and I'm dreading it. Because uh, everything's going to be wrong. <laughs> I guarantee it. Yeah, that's exactly why. Every night at uh, 11.30 or 12, it shuts down. It doesn't shut down. It's The uh, Access is running, I guess, a database system called A? Yeah. Because Access is written in COBOL. It backs to an ingress database. This is very old technology, like 1970s, 1980s. And this is batch job. So every night, so for example, when they... When you drop a course or you sign up for a course, it won't show up till the next day in, in your view of access because it needs to export that data so that the web server can use it. So it takes the data, exports into another database that the web server is able to do stuff. Then you do your changes in access at night, whatever it is, you know, or you rent a locker, whatever. Well, at least lock, locker rentals used to go through access. I don't know if it still does. I might be talking out of my ass, but you know, there's things you can do through access. You make changes in Access, they won't be reflected until the next day because then it exports what's on the web server into files, gets processed by Access, in and out, in and out. Um, but yeah, it works. It's just archaic. Um, it actually uses dumb terminals, like the way you use terminal sessions now, but green screens to get at it. Kind of cool. Um, so yeah, Access is the perfect example of a database application for you guys because you guys that's something you're going to interact with. Another really good example of database applications you guys interact with is Brightspace. It's an LMS. Everything in Brightspace except for files are stored in a database. Like all my labs, descriptions, that's all in the database. It's not stored in files, it's just in a database. So an older view of this would have been user database application talking to the back end. Um, this is not a really common view anymore because most database applications have now been replaced with web apps. So you, when you interact with your bank, if you're doing it on your computer, you're going through a web browser. If you're going through your phone, you're going through whatever application your phone has, right? But your phone's not talking to their database directly. It's talking to something else. But there once was a time when you design, if you did a database application, that's how it was. When I started work, in the industry in 1996. This was the new paradigm where we had client server architectures. We wrote applications that connected to the database server. <laughs> um, yeah. And often these database applications would use SQL. So application would talk, create SQL statements, does stuff to the database server back and forth. Um, so applications are programs that use, people use. I've already talked about this. Um, that's what I'm saying on the slides. <laughs> Sometimes I skip them because we've already talked about it. All right, so multi-user database applications. Uh, good examples would be CRMs and ERPs. Uh, CRMs are customer relation management systems. Uh, Salesforce, anybody here ever hear of Salesforce? Salesforce.com? You will at some point in your lives. I guarantee it. Um, ERP, you may not know what an ERP is, uh, but has anybody here ever uh, taken accounting of some sort? No? How? Oh, I feel old. That used to be like one of the big courses in high school for me, for people that can take accounting for an easy credit. Um, ERPs are accounting systems. Um, so QuickBooks, uh, Trying to think of Sage, so, so those are a few of the big ones that are out there. Um, SAP might be something some of you have heard. SAP is an accounting system. Those are ERPs. It'll have information about the entire organization, money coming in, money coming out, bills being paid, checks being written, payroll, that kind of stuff's all in there. 
Um, E-commerce, use web activity databases for marketing, <coughs> reporting and data mining databases, um, basically used for uh, future performance. If I remember right, you guys have an elective later on called business intelligence. Uh, depending on what you plan to do in your careers, it's actually a really good course to take. Um, basically, the whole course is about learning how to summarize data. It sounds really boring. Um, and depending on how your brain's wired, it is really boring. But it's a really good skill to know. So, some examples of uh, sizes of databases. So, if you have a patient system, I'm going to skip that first one because nobody does that anymore. Uh, patient appointments and for a medical office, uh, there could be 15 to 20, 50, 15 to 50 users, for at least 100,000 rows of data. Um, you know, the doctors don't pay people to write software for them. They just go buy something off the shelf and install it. Um, customer relation management system, uh, that'd be for sales and marketing, customer service. Um, you know, you'll have everything from a, just a few users to thousands of users. They'll have millions upon millions of rows. Um, Microsoft has CRM, Oracle has a CRM. Um, Salesforce.com is basically the biggest one right now. Uh, Sugar CRM is probably another big one. Um, an ERP system manages the entire organization, uh, depending on what kind of organization it is, you'll have thousands upon thousands of users. Um, like I know the company I work for currently has close to a thousand users using their ERP system. And we're not a massively large company, but we're pretty big. You know, I'm like 6,000 empl 6, employees, and there's like a thousand of them that interact with the ERP system. Um, E-commerce sites, obviously possibly millions. Like there's like three people in this room that never used Amazon. So that though everybody else you count as a user. <laughs> so Amazon has millions upon millions, billions of users, uh, billions of rows, uh, digital dashboards and data man manage, uh, mining. Those would be managers and analysts. Um, what's interesting is the dashboards will be the, mil the billions of rows summarized into thousands of rows. So they take all the big data, summarize it, so then uh, managers and analysts can actually make sense of them. So an application program has some basic function. Uh, it creates and processes forms. For example, um, how many of you have filled out a registration form of some sort in the last, say, three weeks online? I mean, okay, let me try turn it around. How many of you have not filled in a registration form sometime, say, in the last month? We'd ask you for your name, your email address, and your phone number kind of thing. You're using an application. It renders the form. It processes the form and puts it into the database somewhere. Access processes your user queries. Every time you look up your timetable, it processes a query. It looks, hey, student number 1234 wants to know what their courses are this week. It runs a query and shows you what courses are. Um, it generates and processes reports. Um, Excuse application logic, and it can control the application itself. The application logic can control the application itself. That's something you guys are going to learn way later in uh, in this program, not this course. So this slide makes me a little laugh because I wanted to replace it, but I couldn't find any reasonable sources. Um, you'll notice that these percentages don't really make a lot of sense. Um, so they're basically it's saying that how many... Out of all the companies in the world, how many of them are using Microsoft SQL Server? It shows 60 to 90%. The reason why there's a, such a gap of 60 to 90% is they don't actually know how many people are using SQL Server. Depending on how software is written, you might be using something like SQL Server Express, which is never registered. It's just a little database that runs on a server somewhere, but they don't know. So they're saying, you know what? Probably 60 to 90% of people use it. Oracle, they've got a better number on that one because Oracle doesn't give out free versions except for su to students. They just have to ask Oracle, what are your sales like? And they can get some reasonable numbers of how many companies are using Oracle. Now, the funny thing about Oracle when you see 40 to 80% is that Oracle's sales 
have been flat for the last 10 years. They're not getting very many new customers and they're not really losing a lot of new customer of old customers either. Because once you're locked into Oracle land, you're in Oracle land. And you're going to keep paying for Oracle. So their sales don't go up, they don't go down. They're just making billions a year on the backs of their existing customers. I'm not saying it's not a good process, product to learn. It's just, you know, Oracle's been dying for 25 years now, but it just has not died. Just like COBOL has been dying since 1975. They released a new version of COBOL two years ago. <laughs> so it's not dying. It's just not growing. Uh, MySQL, 80%. Why is MySQL so high? That's because it is like a foot fungus. It is everywhere. If your website uses WordPress, that's MySQL. Zencart, that's MySQL. Basically put any company that has any kind of CMS, odds are it backs onto MySQL. So the entire internet the visible side of the internet, most of it is running off MySQL. So when they say 80% of companies are using MySQL, yeah, if they've got a website, they're probably using MySQL, whether they want to or not. Um, IBM DB2, that one has a slightly lower number, 15 to 30%. What's really cool about IBM DB2 is it is the number one system used in banks as it runs on mainframes and on minis, and on laptops. They basically, it runs everywhere Oracle does, and then into systems that Oracle does not run on. Like it goes past Oracle. IBM DB2 is insanely powerful. Uh, it's also insanely weird because, you know, it runs on mainframes. Um, Postgres, 15%, that number is absolutely wrong. Uh, it's definitely higher than that. Uh, Postgres currently is the number one growth database server in open source. So if a company wants to use an open source database, 80% of the time they're going to pick Postgres right now. Uh, why? Uh, because Postgres is actually good. <laughs> it's free. Um, it's It does 90% of what Oracle does for free. Um, it is actually on the, uh, the, it's actually the database server they're using on the ISS. So it's in orbit. It's everywhere. Uh, how many of you have a PlayStation? Okay. Every time you log into the PlayStation network, it's actually authenticating against a Postgres database. It's everywhere. It's just, it used to be a lot harder than MySQL to get started with. So people would go to MySQL. Now it's actually easier to install than MySQL. But people still have that legacy of, hey, MySQL is easy. Postgres is just as easy, if not easier. Um, and it's significantly more powerful. Um, Non-relational, you got MongoDB, Hadoop, Cassandra, uh, Ryak, Couchbase. You'll see that these percentages are significantly lower. Um, this, this the whole NoSQL. Some of you may have seen the phrase NoSQL oh, amongst your, you know, looking things up on the internet. Um, no SQL was like a thing where people said, this is such a cool concept. Everybody's going to have to use this. And everybody tried to use it. And then everybody realized that it wasn't any better. It has its place. It's really high performance, but it's not organized. So it's disorganized data. Just got to keep an eye on my time. Yeah, I got lots of time. So when you see these numbers, you'll notice that if we were to add up all the percentages, we'd have 100% of companies using a database of some sort and probably multiple. Like at the company I work at, at least um, my division, we use MySQL and Postgres. Those are the two. Oh, and uh, oh, what the heck is it called? I don't remember, but this tiny little database engine that we embed in our, in, in our applications so we can actually run SQL statements to stay, save all our settings and stuff. Um, I just don't remember what it's called off on my head. It's a tiny little thing. Uh, it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, pretty much every company has a database of some sort. Like literally every company 
has a database of some sort. And so that's why it's important to learn. Okay, so the application uh, executes the logic, it controls the application, uh, it makes sure that only logical options are presented to users, um, and it controls activities to the database. So the database management system has specific functions. It creates databases, creates tables, creates the supporting structures. So basically the database management system actually lets you create the structure of the database. Um, obviously it lets you insert, update, delete data, reads the data, uh, it enforces uh, the rules, controls concurrency, backup and recovery. Um, you will see that in this course, we are going to stop right here. We're going to focus on this bit, the first half. The second half, we're not going to be touching that. Uh, that's a totally different kind of course. All right, so a few other examples. Microsoft Access. Um, Microsoft Access is a personal database system. It has a built-in application generator. Uh, Access is a low-end product. Again, that's another one of those products where it's been dying for years, but it always seems to show up in the next version of Office. Um, and it's always abused, where people use it for what it's really not meant to do. It's really good if you want to keep track of all your Magic cards or all your Pokemon cards. It's really good if you want to keep track of all the DVDs you own or, I don't know, all the places you've been, that kind of stuff. The second you need to have more than one person touching it, it's over. It's a single user database. Um, the one cool thing about Microsoft Access is that it hides the underlying technology. You can create a table and say, from this table, create a form, and it actually generates a data entry form for you. So then you don't even need to look at the table. You can just look at the forms because it does it for you. It dumbs it down. Um, <laughs> the equivalent on Mac would be FileMaker. So I don't know if anybody in here has ever heard the phrase FileMaker, uh, but that's the Mac version of Access, essentially. So the way Access works is you've got the users. It has forms and queries. There's stuff inside of it that actually joined SQL. That goes to the database, and then um, it'll talk to a database at the back end of some sort. Access actually allows you to connect to an external database, so you can use the Access interface to create forms to talk to Microsoft SQL Server, for example. Uh, it's got that built in. Doesn't do a good job of it, arguable, but it's there. On the other hand, you'll have an enterprise class database system. So an enterprise class database system would be Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, MySQL, kind of. And you have the users, and you have all kinds of things that talk to the back end. You've got a standard client server application, uh, e-commerce applications over on a web server, uh, a portal with reporting applications, um, mobile apps. So you touch stuff on your phone, your phone sends a message to some server somewhere. That server interprets your message, then it sends it to the database server back and forth. Uh, XML web services, same thing. Um, it's still around, XML is still around. But essentially, it just asks the database server to what it needs to do. We're almost done. Ooh, it's hot in here, holy cow. You know the best part? I've got another lecture in this room right after you guys leave. <laughs> I'm going to die. Um, anyways, so types of database design processes. So there's a few different ways when you're doing database design. And we're actually going to dive into this, you know, the actual design process more detail, obviously. This is just an overview. Um, you can start from existing data. So you're going to analyze spreadsheets and other data tables, extract the data from the other databases. Um, then you can do some normalization process, uh, principles. So you take what, what is known data and you create a database based on the known data. You don't see that very much anymore. This was a big thing in the 80s and the 90s when companies were 
doing a lift and shift from paper to electronic. <laughs> um, it still happens, but just not as much. Um, new system development. Somebody determines what an application should be, and you design it based on the back and forth. So you're working in a clean room. It's from scratch. You get to be creative. Um, it actually tends to be one of the harder ones because it's really easy to miss things. Unless you've been doing it for a long time, it's really easy to miss things. Um, so then you create a data model, you're going to turn it into a database design, and you'll have a database. Um, like when I talk about new system development, um, anybody in here ever work in construction? Okay, anybody ever build something from a set of plans? And you realize halfway through that the plans aren't complete, there's something missing in the plan. And you're like, why do I have this part? Where'd this come from? Because the instructions weren't good enough, so you missed a part. When you design a database, you'll end up with some of that where you suddenly have this one piece and you're going, I don't know what this was for. So you missed a step. So that's part of the danger of the new system development. And then there's the database redesign. So you're going to migrate old systems into a new system. Um, you might be integrating multiple databases. So you're going to take um, an old CRM system that was maybe written in-house and an old customer and an old expert system that was written in-house. You're going to put them together and shake it up and, you know, hope it's usable. Um, you could be reverse engineering and designing a new database. So you have um, an existing database, but they want you to recreate it without using what's actually there. Uh, that's a redesign. So the structured design lifecycle. So you guys are in CT. You guys are going to learn about the SLDC, the software, as that's already SDLC. It's pretty much the same acronyms. the software development lifecycle, but there's also the structured design lifecycle. So it's basically the same thing, but specific to database. So you'd start with assessing your needs. Uh, you do some feasibility analysis. Uh, you generate some alternatives. And this is something that's really, really important. Like you, often when you work for a company that is big enough, they'll suddenly decide, you know what, we can do it ourselves. We've got the talent. We can do it ourselves. A good systems analysis person will look at what they want, go look at what's available out there, see how close you can find something that supports what you want, and decide, and then present, you know, this is going to cost X amount of dollars if we do it ourselves. We have no support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we go and we buy this off the shelf, yeah, it's going to cost us $70,000, but is it going to come with a year of tech support? They're going to provide, you know, 100 hours of, of customization. They're going to do the migration for you. So suddenly at $70,000, that, you know, sounds expensive starting out is really cheap. Because, <laughs> I mean, in any company, <coughs> excuse me, what is the most expensive resource? Pardon? Yeah, people. By far the most expensive resource. I mean, yeah, you've got big companies that buy computers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, but even then, when you do the math, employees are expensive. So if you had that $70,000 piece of software that they said, oh, that's too expensive, you go, okay, so we're going to take four of our developers at $80,000 a year to work on it for the next year. You know, $320,000 versus 70000 you know. And then you evaluate all the alternatives, <laughs> choose, the choose it, uh, do some design work if applicable, develop and test, implement, evaluate the implementation, take that evaluation, assess some more needs, and then you start all over again. It never ends. It just keeps going and going and going until you know the product either dies or it's replaced. But essentially, it never ends being updated. Um, this is the exact same thing, but it's the waterfall view where this is usually what happens when you're doing it for a third party. So you're a contracting company or a consultant. There's not as much of the circle when you're a consultant because they'll come in, you do design. When you're done, they evaluate, is it good enough? 
If not, you do a couple of fixes and then you walk away. That's the what they call the waterfall view. Okay, so review the course textbook. Make sure you uh, enrich your learning. Hybrid tasks as I release them to you. Um, don't forget your assessments. And take a, keep an eye on all the due dates to avoid getting zeros automatically. Um, and outside of that, that's where we are at. So we've hit the end of today. I will uh, post an announcement either tonight or tomorrow with everything you guys should be working on this week, including things you should be reading. Outside of that, I will see you guys either in lab or here next week.